Hey guys, welcome to this week's FAQ in Freebie Friday. Now for those of you new to our channel, these videos are dedicated to answering your health related questions. So if you have a question concerning your health, something regarding nutrition, herbalism, Chinese medicine, or really anything under the umbrella of health and wellness, and you would like our help in answering those questions, all you have to do is leave your questions in the comment section below We'll be answering those based on popularity, our ability to answer those questions, and the questions that will be most beneficial to the whole community. Now, something else really great about these videos is that every week from the comment section, we select one lucky person to win a free bag of tonic herbs or medicinal mushrooms of their choice. So even if you don't have a question for us this week, but you're interested in winning some free herbs or mushrooms, all you have to do to be entered to win is make sure you give this video a thumbs up, subscribe to our YouTube channel if you haven't yet, and just drop any old comment in the comment section below. Now with all that out of the way, let's get into this week's questions. All right, so looking at our first question, this one reads, what herbs do you recommend for severe muscle spasms and joint pain? I suffer from severe TMJ. All right, so there's a couple of things I wanna mention first in regards to TMJ, muscle spasms and joint pain. These are three separate things, but also all very interrelated. The way I see it, TMJ is a stress-related disorder. It's very much driven by stress and probably caused by stress. For those of you that do not know, TMJ refers to inflammation of the joint in the jaw. And I actually have a girlfriend who has TMJ and her mom has TMJ. One of my best friends have TMJ. So I've definitely seen a lot of correlations, overlaps with potential triggers and potential causes. And there's also some physiology I wanna share with you as well. So I wanna cover it from all bases. Some basic things that you can do using herbs and natural remedies or supplements, as well as addressing maybe underlying psychosomatic causes. So stress related causes, at least things that I observe. So starting off with some of the basic pathology and physiology of TMJ, remember this is an inflammatory condition right in the joint of the jaw. So what is inflammation then? What's driving the inflammation? Because this is ultimately an inflammatory condition at this point, but Stress is what ultimately drives inflammation and stress of all sorts. So psychological stress, various physiological stressors can drive inflammation. Because as I talk about in some of our other videos on inflammation, inflammation is really not necessarily a natural healing process. It's natural in the sense that your body is supplying all the various inflammatory substances to cope with stress and damage. But the fact of the matter is, when the body starts to lose this ability to produce energy to cope with stress, there's a greater likelihood of inflammation. So inflammation tends to be very minimal in very healthy people. So take a look at a child. You know, they fall down, they get scraped up, beat up, and they heal and regenerate really fast and tend to not experience much inflammation at all. And this is a physiological fact that when the metabolism is robust, when the body is capable of producing tons of energy and capable of responding to stress very efficiently, then there's little to no inflammation through the regenerative or healing process. So looking at TMJ in this way, if it's an inflammatory condition, that means it's ultimately a stress-related condition. So to some degree, your body is not coping with stress very efficiently. This is either because the stress is great, the stress is perhaps chronic or very long-term, meaning that you've been stressed over a longer duration of time, a couple of days, maybe even a couple of weeks, or your body's ability to produce energy has decreased over time with stress, aging, or maybe even various diseases could be affecting your metabolism and your ability to produce energy. Because here's the simplified version of it. If we look at some of the research or the theories of an early physiologist by the name of Hans Selye, he basically came up with this idea of adrenal fatigue. He's really one of the pioneers of physiological stress. He basically found that when mice were exhausted from stress, meaning that they experienced so much stress, their bodies became depleted, what he found was that the thyroid and the adrenals basically became too weak to produce adaptive stress substances, so various adrenal steroids, as well as thyroid hormone to cope with the various stress. And this actually results in an increased production of adaptive stress substances that lead to inflammation. 
So when your body is working efficiently, your thyroid usually is producing enough thyroid hormone, you're producing other anti-stress hormones like progesterone, and those are the primary hormones next to pregnenolone for coping with stress and supplying the body with energy and the ability to regenerate. However, if stress is either severe, meaning it's very traumatic, it's an intense stress, or the stress is chronic, typically, the body's ability to produce enough thyroid hormone, enough progesterone, pregnenolone declines, resulting in the increased reliance of stress substances that are going to be damaging over the long term. And these stress substances tend to be things like cortisol and other stress hormones like prolactin, which tend to actually do damage over the long term. So in the short term, the cortisol and the prolactin even, can help mobilize nutrients and help you cope with stress. This is why typically people with inflammatory conditions get cortisone or like cortisol injections because on the very short term, it's going to help sort of give your body a high of energy, a false energy high, unfortunately, to cope with the inflammation and the stress. In fact, in most inflammatory conditions, cortisol levels tend to be actually very high in the thyroid hormone, the progesterone, and the primary anti-stress substances tend to get deficient. In very severe cases, your body's producing very little of any of these substances, which causes tremendous amounts of pain and inflammation and disease. So the very simplified version of this is that over the long duration of time, if your body's too stressed out, your thyroid's not going to work enough to produce energy, you're not going to produce the right sorts of anti-stress hormones to cope with the stress and that's going to result in inflammation. And it, instead, your body starts to become more reliant on these secondary adaptive stress substances that are primarily secreted by the adrenal glands. So things again like cortisol, prolactin, estrogen, adrenaline, these are all stress adrenal hormones that are good in a short-term survival situation, but over the long-term, they can actually further the or worsen the problem because they can lead to actual tissue destruction. For example, when all these substances start to become chronically elevated, prolactin can start to increase the parathyroid hormone, which suppresses the thyroid and starts to mobilize calcium from your bones just to cope with the stress on the short term. So this can lead to things like osteoporosis. It can cause not just tissue damage, but it can also cause even joint damage as well. It can basically catabolize the joint the cartilage in the joint, etc. So with all of that being said, basically TMJ is a maladaptive response to stress. Like most degenerative diseases and conditions are, most chronic inflammatory conditions are actually just maladaptive responses to stress, meaning your body doesn't have enough energy to cope with stress in a less damaging way. So Tying this into your question though, if you look at muscle spasms and joint pain, well muscle spasms is usually a pretty good indicator that your body's really stressed out because one thing that tends to occur during chronic stress is the depletion of magnesium, calcium, and other important minerals like potassium and sodium to cope with the stress and try to mitigate the damaging effects of these other stress substances. So the depletion of all of these important minerals could actually directly be one of the major causes of the muscle spasms. So for me, that just indicates that it's definitely stress-driven. Uh, in my personal experience, every person I've ever seen with TMJ, it's always triggered by psychological stress usually more than it is even physical stress. So like exercise stress or not getting enough sleep, it definitely seems to be the most powerfully driven by psychological stress. So this can happen again over the duration of a couple of days and this can lead to the depletion of important minerals leading to the muscle spasms and eventually this can start to tax your endocrine glands and your endocrine system, making your body incapable of coping with the stress efficiently and that will eventually result in inflammation. So if you wanna to get to it at the very root, you're gonna to wanna to figure out your primary triggers. Just becoming aware of those is gonna be very beneficial. Something that I see on the other end, getting into more of the psychological, psychosomatic, is my own observation, and I responded to somebody in the FAQ once on this, is that I see a strong psychosomatic correlation. You know, your jaw is basically what helps to open your mouth so you can talk. So I often see that people with TMJ, their psychological stress trigger is always something with like confrontation with talking. It's like they wanna say something, but they don't wanna say something. So it's like they kind of keep their mouth shut. You know, if you have nothing nice to say, say nothing at all. I kind of see that underlying 
belief system or consideration, I guess, in a lot of people with TMJ. At least from what I have observed, these people tend to have a difficult time having confrontational conversations. So they have things they wanna talk about, but they don't wanna talk about them. So if you're trying to face a situation through conversation alone, this might be more difficult. You know, communicating takes effort. It's a force. However, one thing that you could do or a couple of tips here for managing this, instead of trying to force yourself to talk about something that makes you uncomfortable to talk about, maybe just try facing it in your own mind. You can confront a situation and look at it in your head and just kind of observe it and face it and see it for what it is without necessarily having to talk about it. And that's one way of facing it and understanding it and kind of resolving the stress. However, other people might find it more helpful and practical to be able to just talk to somebody else about it or even just journal it down, write it out. Just find some way to express it and put it out so that way you don't have this tension in your jaw. Now, again, this is just a hypothesis, a theory, something I observe and having a background in cognitive therapy, I tend to go there mentally as well. So if this isn't the case for you and you have some other sort of psychological trigger or stress trigger, keep in mind, it could be anything. It could be a financial stress. It could be a relationship stress. It could be anything that's chronically stressing you out that's just tensing you up. I only go to this point because it's interesting how it manifests in the jaw for some people other people hold their stress and tensions in various other body parts, you know, their stomach or something like that. So this is, again, just an observation. I could be entirely wrong, but I definitely see it to be true in at least a couple of people I know personally. However, if this is not the case, there's some other things that you can do while you work out and find your primary stress triggers. Some tips on how to do that would be go back in your mind and figure out what problems or stressors were you dealing with just before you noticed you started to get the flare up in the jaw. This usually is a good indicator of what the potential stress is. And if you can face whatever stress triggered it in the first place, it'll probably just clear up on its own in time. So that's always the most ideal thing to do is get to the root, the cause, and solve it there. However, from that point, as you asked, there are some herbal recommendations, some dietary lifestyle recommendations that could help your body cope with stress more efficiently and therefore deal with inflammation or cope with a stress or an injury without much inflammation. So some simple things, just looking at the pathology, I would definitely recommend in regards to herbs, taking some Nervine herbs. So herbs like Chinese skull cap and valerian, they help to relax the nervous system. They're really good on the short term in this way to sort of help you unwind and relax. However, again, this is more or less an anecdote. It's something that's going to help in the short term to sort of unwind the body. But if you aren't facing that underlying stress, it's just going to keep coming back. So in addition to correcting the underlying root cause, I definitely recommend some Nervine herbs. In addition to those herbs, I'd recommend maybe some GABA agonists. So these are things that tend to increase the production of GABA, which will put you in a more parasympathetic, relaxed state. So in regards to herbs, KSM 66 ashwagandha is a great one, but you can also supplement with things like glycine, and L-thionine. All three of these together I find to be incredible and very helpful in this way for relaxing the body. In addition to promoting GABA and relaxing you in this way, most GABA agonists, things that increase GABA, also lower cortisol. So all these things are great for both of those, really helpful for stress. Not to mention that they're all going to be beneficial to the thyroid and the more energy that you have, the more your body's going to be able to cope with stress without basically relying on the destructive stress hormones. However, TMJ, like most other disorders, are usually systemic in nature, meaning that there's tons of things that are contributing to them, and they're mostly related to stress and inflammation and low energy production. So really anything that helps you de-stress, unwind, and feel more energetic naturally is generally gonna be beneficial. I look at health and disease from a very simplified viewpoint, Health, I look at as effortless effort, resistantlessness. So you feel pleasure, joy, and anything that is attributing to dis-ease literally makes you feel that. Cut off from ease, pain, discomfort. So in regards to lifestyle tips, I usually recommend anybody, no matter what they're dealing with, to just find things that make them feel good and 
engage in those things more and just sort of cut off from things that are causing you pain and discomfort and slowly build up your ability to face uncomfortable situations so that way you don't necessarily have to cut off from various things in life and run from anything that's uncomfortable but also not have to experience tons of pain and discomfort and dissatisfaction on a chronic basis. So hopefully these things help. Again, anything that's gonna help you relax, you got a couple of different herbs and supplements, and then of course, talking things out and getting that tension out of the jaw could probably be very helpful as well. All right, getting to our next question. This one reads, any suggestions for Crohn's? Thank you for all your info. So for those of you that do not know, Crohn's is an inflammatory condition of the bowels. It's actually a fibrotic condition of the bowels where the intestinal tissue is so chronically inflamed that it ultimately becomes fibrotic or scarred. And this obviously leads to tissue dysfunction and all sorts of digestive issues, tons of pain, oftentimes there's bleeding. And really it's, I think, one of the meccas of digestive disorders and diseases. It's kind of like the last leg of digestive diseases. There's lots of little digestive issues that lead up. And then eventually, you know, if you have Crohn's, I'd imagine that your digestive system has been not functioning properly for a very long time. So with all of that being said, my basic tips for Crohn's are first and foremost going to be very similar tips to anybody with any sort of digestive issue. So getting to the root of what a good digestive system requires, also looking at things that ruin a good digestive system. But the only unique consideration or special consideration with Crohn's is that it is a chronic inflammatory and fibrotic condition. So you might want to take special consideration to antifibrotic substances. And just to name a few off the top of my head that are safe, very well studied for and safe to use for the long term and of course effective are going to be things like aspirin. Actually, just make sure you get a good pharmaceutical grade aspirin with no fillers and weird stuff like that. You might actually have to get a prescription. And if you're not a fan of taking some sort of pharmaceutical like that, I understand. It's just aspirin is actually super safe. It's super clean and pure if you get the pharmaceutical stuff without the fillers. And there's really no negative side effects with aspirin. A lot of the things that are blamed on aspirin are actually the byproduct of acetaminophen. So things like Tylenol, those are highly toxic to the liver. And there's actually really interesting studies that find that aspirin can actually reverse the damaging toxic effects of acetaminophen. So really the only thing with aspirin is that it can deplete vitamin K2 because it basically just acts like vitamin K2 in the body, which is very beneficial for fibrosis because K2 helps to regulate calcium metabolism. So just only stick to like 320 some milligrams of the aspirin and supplement two milligrams of vitamin K2. So that way you're getting both the synergistic effects from both of those things, but also you're avoiding any K2 deficiencies. If you don't wanna take aspirin, just stick to taking a decent dose of vitamin K2, just ensuring that you're also getting your other fat soluble vitamins. So vitamin A, vitamin E, vitamin D, so that way you're balancing all those fat soluble vitamins out and not leading to any deficiencies and imbalances there. In addition to vitamin K2 and aspirin, one of the most antifibrotic things that you could ever come into contact with is the sunlight. So I'd recommend getting daily sunlight, actually getting as much sunlight as possible. And its antifibrotic effects are largely through its ability to lower prolactin, which is one of the major hormones that's elevated in fibrosis and things like Crohn's and its ability to boost dopamine and do a lot of other really great things. So, so far, aspirin, if not aspirin, vitamin K2, get some daily sunlight, and two other powerful antifibrotic substances are going to be, number one, glycine. So if you're not consuming bone broth on a regular basis, start doing that immediately. I think that's one of the best things that anybody could take, but especially if you have digestive issues like Crohn's or any digestive issues, regular daily glycine consumption should be a must. So whether you're getting it through a glycine supplement, taking a gelatin or collagen supplement, or making your own bone broth, or even consuming gelatinous cuts of meat, the glycine is powerfully antifibrotic and anti-inflammatory through various different mechanisms, this ability 
to lower cortisol, to lower a lot of inflammatory substances to support the stress response. It's obviously anti-inflammatory, which gives it its antifibrotic effect. But more importantly, studies found that glycine regularly can actually reverse fibrotic tissue, restoring its natural functioning and coherence. And that's what you want if you have Crohn's. You want those intestines to regenerate and rejuvenate. Fortunately, the skin is very, very efficient at regenerating and rejuvenating, granted that you remove the inflammation. So one thing that you could do, again, is just consume some source of glycine on a regular basis to cope with the stress, get rid of the inflammation so that way your intestinal tissue can heal again and get back to its normal state. And the last substance that I would highly recommend putting an emphasis on would be a compound known as apigenin. This is a flavone that actually is also anti-inflammatory an antifibrotic. You can find it in foods like white button mushrooms, really well cooked white button mushrooms if you have digestive issues, or you can take an agaricus mushroom extract powder. You could take an extract of something like chamomile or just consume chamomile tea. You also find it in celery, so celery juice could be good as well, and guava. So those are all great sources of foods in herbs and teas or whatever for anybody with digestive issues. So in practice, this might mean you know consuming some chamomile tea or maybe even adding some chamomile to your bone broth and then adding in some additional gelatin. So that way you're getting this super powerful antifibrotic substance. But in addition to that, basically all digestive issues are stress related. The nervous system rules digestion. So again, like the TMJ thing, this is a stress driven issue. And what I see in people with digestive issues is they are very mentally stressed. So I observe different types of people. I see people that are the most carefree people in the world mentally and emotionally, but then their stressors or their difficult area is in somewhere else. It's maybe in nutrition or exercise or whatever the case is. But I typically see a sort of personality. I think I actually have an entire blog post that talks about the personality of people with digestive issues. So that might be an interesting read. In general, just check out my blog, check out the Vitaging blog. I have an online course called Perfect Digestion that will tell you everything you really need to know about digestive health. So if you want additional tips, go there. Reference all the videos we have here on the channel. I think we have one really good video on the Vitaging YouTube channel that talks about digestive health and some things you can do. So definitely grab all those free resources. And if that's not enough, definitely check out my online course. Otherwise, again, the root thing is gonna be managing your stress. So get a handle on that stress, whatever you can, simple things to make you feel total ease and no resistance. That's all stress is, it's just resistance, it's pressure. So get rid of any of the resistance in your life. You know, Take the path of least resistance whenever you can as you build up your ability to face resistance. And then simple things in regards to diet, I'll just give it to you right here, all in one go. Here are the foods you want to never consume if you have digestive issues. All grains, I don't care if they're fermented or not. All nuts and seeds, doesn't matter if they're soaked or not. All of the oils that come from grains, nuts and seeds, so your polyunsaturated fats, the canola, the soy, the flax, the hemp, even the avocado oil, obviously the bad oil, so all of your unhealthy vegetable oils, get rid of all of those. Other things you probably want to avoid too with Crohn's is actually a great deal of vegetables. A lot of vegetables are very difficult to digest. The polymers and the cellulose in vegetables are going to ferment and they're gonna to lead to digestive issues, especially in somebody with weak digestion. So although vegetables are considered the staple health food, they're not really all that essential. Uh, they tend to be very difficult to digest, again, unless well cooked or juiced or something. And anything that you'll find in a vegetable in regards to micronutrients, you'll find it in a much more abundant and bioavailable form in most animal products actually. So for example, there's calcium inside leafy greens, but it's bound to oxalate acid, which damages your kidneys and suppresses your thyroid. You're gonna get more bioavailable calcium from raw milk. So just as an example, I would actually get rid of probably a great deal of vegetables. And when it comes to eating fruit, you just wanna make sure it's really, really, really ripe. Unripe fruit that has complex polymers that will lead to gas and digestive issues. So that's a no as well. So the person with digestive issues is gonna to have to eat like sort of like an elderly person in a way. So focus on you know soups, well-cooked soups. Focus on well-cooked potatoes, high-quality meats, eggs if you can tolerate them, 
consume dairy if you can get it raw, non-homogenized, or at the very least, vat pasteurized. And you might have to start off slow until you build your tolerance up. Focus on really, really well-cooked uh, ripe fruits. So in most cases, you're going to want to cook your fruit. That's going to be beneficial as well. When it comes to like potatoes and fruits, you're probably going to want to peel those things. Uh, stick to pureed foods if you have to. You know, if you have Crohn's, you're going to have to probably go through like a therapeutic phase where, you know, your diet's almost like baby food. It's like starting all over again. But those are the things you're going to want to avoid mostly. The grains, the beans, legumes, nuts and seeds, all the oils from those things. And really anything that has too much fiber. Too much fiber is likely going to ferment in the gut. So the safest forms of fiber that I'm aware of, especially for people with digestive issues, is going to be well-cooked fruit that's also ripe. So cook some apples and pears down really well. Cook some potatoes down really well. Mushrooms are good sources of fiber. Cook them down very well as well. And other than that, you know, it's again just about keeping the stress low, eating an easy to digest diet. And you also want to make sure you don't go too low calorie with all this stuff because the slower your thyroid and metabolism gets, the slower your rate of digestion gets. So a lot of the times people with Crohn's disease also have hypothyroidism. So definitely check out our other videos on treating thyroid health. All right, guys, that brings this week's FAQ and Freebie Friday to a close. I'm going to end this video here before it gets too long. If you've enjoyed it and found it helpful, be sure to give it a big thumbs up. Now, if you're interested in winning some free herbs or medicinal mushrooms, remember all you have to do is give this video a thumbs up, subscribe to our YouTube channel, and just drop a comment in the comment section below. Thanks so much for watching, guys, and we'll see you next time.